Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speakers. Uh, we'll be joining Kathy Jones and Kaylin Bumelis for an overview of the Atlas Special Surveys and Digital Point Counts. Kathy will give the rundown of all the special surveys, what they are, where and how to conduct them, and what is needed to participate. And following this, Kaylin will discuss how digital point counts are collected, interpreted, and uploaded to the Atlas. So Kathy is an avid supporter of conservation, habitat stewardship, and biodiversity. She believes in the strength of grassroots community actions and that each individual can make a difference. Kathy holds a master's degree in forestry from Lakehead University, where she studied bald eagle management, a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Biology from the University of Guelph, as well as a certificate in volunteer management. This skill set works well in her present position, supporting citizen science scientists for Birds Canada. Kaylin's introduction to bird research was as a wildlife technician during the summers of her undergraduate studies. After that, she was hooked and so decided to pursue a Master of Science in Biology at Western University. Kaylin is now the Assistant Coordinator for the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas, and she feels extremely fortunate to work alongside dedicated volunteers, collaborators, and staff towards a shared goal of bird conservation. Just a quick reminder that technical issues you can just put into the chat as well as general comments, uh, and someone will help you out. Any questions, please use the Q&A. And with that, uh, please take it away, Kathy. Thanks, um, Tanya. I really appreciate you doing that. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Um, I think I have that right. Yes, I do. All right. So you guys can see my talk. Maybe I can get a thumbs up from someone. Um, Looks good. Okay, thank you, Tanya. So as, as Tanya mentioned, I'm looking at the special surveys component of the Atlas, and it's a pretty cool selection, and I am delighted to be involved with it. Um, and so we're going to go over several things today. This is going to be a very much a high-end conversation because there's so much involved with all of these. I can't get into the weeds on this. I just do not have the time. No, it's that requires you to read the protocols predominantly. Um, I will also make a mention now that the discussion um, system that, uh, is a great way to ask questions. There's an active special surveys discussion forum there. But we'll go over why do we do these surveys? What are the survey options? Who can do these surveys? Where you can survey? When are they conducted? How do you survey the protocols? And how do you enter the data? And like I said, it's going to be all at quite a high level. So first off, where do you find the surveys? Um, if you go to the Birds Ontario Atlas site and go to Tools and Resources, um, you then choose Special Surveys. And you can just click on Special Surveys, and it will get you to the right spot. Or you can choose from there Owl and Nightjar Surveys and Marsh Bird Surveys. So that's where all the information and resources pertaining to these special surveys are located. So that's an important website to know. Now, why do we do these surveys? As you've heard already here, uh, the point counts are quite important to the Atlas because they uh, provide information on a relative abundance, such as this map here for um, Eastern speech owls um, from Atlas II, I believe. Um, and in Atlas II, they actually did an Eastern screech owl survey as well. Um, by, but there are, um, and that's what makes it important for this program to include these point counts in the Atlas. It allows us more powerful information to share about the birds in Ontario and about comparing things to the previous Atlas. But there are certain species that just don't fit well into the classic point count. Things you won't hear in the daytime, things you won't hear in, in all 20 of your normal points, just doing it traditional fashion. So there, these key species, we're looking for other ways to improve our detections of them. And it's all about improving detections of these species. Um, and so special point counts have been designed for them. These are great fun. I have done many special survey point counts, marsh monitoring, whippoorwills, night jars, owls, and they are fun to do. Um, they also need a bit of a lower 
identification skill set. So they're a great option for somebody who wants to work in citizen science, but are not confident they're there to do the regular point counts either. Um, so, and on top of all this, we're talking shared techniques. A lot of people are gonna sit and say, okay, we already have data collected on these particular topics. Yes, we do. But the, the distribution of the survey points for these special surveys that are similar, Marshall Monitoring, Ontario Owl Surveys, Canadian Night Jar Survey, don't necessarily match the needs of the Atlas for the, the point counts and the um, relative abundance maps they want to produce. So while the data, the techniques used within the Atlas are close enough to the text techniques used in these other four programs that, the, that um, they can be shared in analysis. They look at different locations and we need more data collected than just from these three. I should make a note that if you do do these surveys and collect data form, your data can be and will likely be pushed into the Atlas. And because it all goes and ends up helping the same cause, if you are a surveyor for these ones, and if you want to try these surveys, go out and try those as well. They, many of them need volunteers depending on where you are. So, there's also new knowledge collected. Um, two species that came up when we were doing, when the OWL committee looked at um, data available, we felt that there was a gap for northern hawk owl, owls and a gap for long-eared owls. So there's two very unique surveys that have been designed for these two species. Um, the northern hawk owl is a broadcast survey that's done in the daytime. And the long-eared owl, it looks at for juveniles and, and for young of the year. So because of that, those two special surveys are the first of their kind and we're including them in the Alice and we're quite excited to see what results we will get from these. So that gives you two more interesting examples to work with. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what the data is like after this first year. So what are your survey options? As we mentioned before, there are owls and night jars and marsh birds. So how does that um, work out in what's available? First, you have your nighttime surveys, which are eastern screech owl, barred owl and northern sawwood owl, great gray owl and boreal owl, and long-eared owl. And what you're seeing right now is just screen captures from the, the website. You also have your nighttime or surveys, or I should say, beginning of night surveys. The night jar survey starts just before sunset and continues past sunset. So it's, um, um, it's a little bit different in what time it happens. And then you also have your daytime surveys, which are um, the marsh board surveys, which are done um, in, in the early day and the northern hawk owl survey, which can be done anytime during the day. Now, I find people are a little scared of these surveys. Um, there is a protocol for everyone in this like, whoa, that's a lot of paperwork. Um, but they're all consistent in many ways. Um, so you're gonna find when you start reading these protocols, you're gonna see a lot of the same information and many things that are done in a similar fashion. But the next question is, which one is right for you? Who can do these surveys? And they do vary. They have different skill levels. They have different locations. They have different tools needed for the survey and different timing of the surveys. And as a citizen scientist, you have to look at all these and decide which one suits you. But I put this up because of this concern about skill levels and point counts. Um, I find most of these surveys, you need some identification skills, but not near the level as you would for say a point count that's in a forest or a point count that's in a marsh. So most of these, I would consider them a minimum skill level. Exceptions is a long eared owl survey. Um, that one's interesting because you have to be able to identify young long eared owls. And that's a learned technique and you can learn it probably with the means that they recommend, but it is a special skill. Um, and then the marsh bird survey is one of the more higher skill levels with the atlas because you need to be able to identify by size, sight and often by sound, all the survey points, all the birds that you might hear in that spot. Now, the next question would be, well, can I use my Merlin app? I can just see that question coming. 
I would not advise it for most of these. The owl ones are probably long enough that if you're really questioning a bird after your survey and after the broadcast goes down, you can try to catch it then. But for the marsh bird survey, you will find that you don't have time during your survey window to pull out an app and use it to, to track sound. You will lose track of birds when you do it. With that said, like I said, don't underestimate your skills. There's many people out there who are more than capable of doing these surveys, especially the owl and the night jar ones. You just, um, it just takes a little bit more upfront work to figure out where to survey, and then you can go off and you can survey. So speaking of where you can survey, where do you survey? Well, this map is, is in all the protocols, I think, and it's a basic layout of three regions, Southern, Central, and Northern Ontario. And these regions are based on the three main owl surveys. If you're choosing the primary point counts for Eastern Scree owl, Screech Owl surveys are the Southern region. The primary point counts for Barred Owl surveys are the Central region. The primary point counts for the Northern survey, um, so for great gray owls are that northern region and the same as not northern hawk owls they fall into that northern region and i can just see people saying oh but i'm in southern ontario we have barred owls yes you do but it's quite often you it's fragmented system and you might get one barred owl over a very large area and it's it's, it's a reasonable question to say is there enough data going to be collected in the in the um very few points there to do an owl survey on it or are you just better off listening at night and doing a checklist in that in that particular fragmented forest? So that's the kind of thing you look at. So the priority is um, the the region is is southern is is eastern screech owl, central is um, barred owl, northern is great gray, and if this overlaps, you can consider doing the second owl survey as well if you feel it's appropriate in that area. And I would talk to your RC first and make sure that they think it's a good idea. So you've seen the point count maps already today. And so you have this list of 40 sites um, that you have to choose your owl stations at. So what you do is you always start at the first one on the list, point one, and you visually inspect it and you go look at it with the protocol information in hand that tells you the habitat that you're looking for for the species because each species will have a, a specific habitat guideline for it. You look at that point one, you say, is this appropriate to habitat for the species, yes or no? If it's yes, that's the first one you survey, and you add it to your list of survey points. If it's no, you go on to the nest, and you do this yes, no, is it appropriate habitat for as many points from one forward until you get up to 10 appropriate points. I personally would say go beyond 10, get about 12, because you don't know what the situation is going to be like at night. If you're out there at night, things can change, so having a couple backup points help. Now, you do need to choose your point starting at one, going, going up in numbers, but you don't have to survey in, in that order. If it makes logical sense to go to point 36, because it's the furthest way from your house, and work your way back, that is okay, as long as you chose your point in that standard system. Now, a common question that I've heard several times and I've seen on the, on the Discord um, is not enough habitat. I mentioned earlier, check with your RCs, make sure no one else is surveying that point. Make sure you, you, if it's a questionable survey for that area, make sure that they're okay with you doing it. The next question is, there's not enough habitat. I can only get four points or five points. And if you're in the primary region for that species and you can only get five points, it's great. Do the five points within that square. Um, um, as long as it's the right choice for that location, that's great. If you find that, um, and that's the biggest thing to remember, remember all those other squares around you are being surveyed as well. Now, marshes are a little bit of a different beast. Um, the marsh survey um, is, an, is um, can be done on any atlas square in marsh habitat patches. But there is, there is so much out there, and there's so few volunteers to this program, they have prior, prioritized squares that they'd like to see done. And when you get to the website, you can see these. And so that's the ideal situation. They'd like to get those squares done first. Um, and it's the same thing 
You start with those points that are on the map, but you figure out where to survey a little bit differently. It's almost guaranteed that your 40 random points are not going to fall on marshes all um, because they are random points. So to stratify this and keep it in a stratified sampling, uh, um, statistically accurate sampling, what they've recommended you do is you go point one, and I would use a map or I would use Google map or a satellite image for this. And from point one, find the nearest marsh habitat, habitat patch to it, check it and see if it's okay. And if it is, you survey that one. Go to point two, follow that same process. Go to point three and follow that same process until you end up with eight habitat patches that are appropriate marsh habitat. And I'm, I'm not gonna get into what's appropriate marsh habitat here, it's in the protocol. If we have time at the end, I can answer that question. Um, when you get up to eight patches that you can survey, those are your survey sampling stations. I, I myself, I would choose a ninth patch, maybe a 10 patch, just in case you need it later and you get to a site and you find it doesn't work for some reason like safety or noise or something like that. Um, something I wanted to note, many of you folks may have already done the Marsh Monitoring Program, uh, which is an important survey to conduct, but it has a more defined habitat requirement than this thing. You actually are more opportunities to survey for this survey in Northern Ontario and in some areas of Ontario than you would get to the Marsh Monitoring Program. So if you've looked at the Marsh Monitoring Program and said, oh, there's nothing appropriate for me in my area, check out this one instead. You may find there's more appropriate sites for you with this program. So when are they conducted? Well, it all depends on the survey. If you look at this graph, and I should mention that this guide is part of the appendices for the main Atlas protocol. And it is a list of all the um, different survey sites that you can survey, or the different techniques and when you do it. Um, so it's available for you to look at regularly. And it tells you the time of day and the month and let you know if you need a broadcast. So this is a correct reference thing for you to help decide if this survey is appropriate for you. And you can use this to plan your year. <coughs> Excuse me. And where do you find the protocols and all that stuff? As I mentioned before, it's, it's in the Atlas website under tools and resources, special surveys. And there's a section for every species and there's a protocol, the forms, and the playback, if you need playback for that particular route. Now, another important part of um, the protocol is a booklet, of course, and there is instructions for everyone. And early on in the booklet, when you download it, you see a page called the Quick Guide. This is great if you're trying to figure out where to survey. Um, this will help you decide if the survey is appropriate for you quite quickly. You just have to read through these for every cert protocol and you have a really good idea. In addition, you should read the whole protocol before you attempt the survey. This is handy when you're in the, the uh, your first, first few points and you're trying to decide what to do, or it's been a long night and you've forgotten what you have to do. You read this over and it will help you out. So it's an important part of the survey protocol that's worth remembering exists. So I wanted to mention something about standardization. We put all this work into play to make sure that the points are selected in a random way or consistently in a way that everybody does the same thing. And that's very important, important when you're doing point counts like this is to try to match those standards of quality for every survey. And there's so many variables like weather and person survey and all of that we can't control. We try to control what we can. So some things to avoid two atlases surveying the same square. First off um, is double detections. Um, you're changing the detection rates on the site. Second off, there's no guarantee that if you're standing on the east side and they're standing on the north side and somebody plays a call, you're not gonna think it's an owl. So talk to your RCs, make sure there's nobody else in there. Two different surveys in the same square right after each other. We just had a discussion of this on Discord and we took it back to the committee to decide what is best. And we've decided that ideally we would like to have um, two different surveys on the same square, 10 days apart, I'm sorry, five, um, seven days apart, unless you're in a situation where it's just not logistically feasible. Like if you're surveying points in a northern um, 
canoe trip or if you're on a very northern route you're only going to have one day in your schedule to get there that sort of thing or if you're on an island in those situations just try to time out your two surveys as far as pot, apart as possible um paying playing part of the broadcast versus playing the whole broadcast because all but two of these surveys use a broadcast the two that don't is the um long-eared owl Watch me get this wrong. Long-eared owl and the um, the night jar survey are the two that don't. So when you play the the broadcast, you want to play the whole thing. And remember, before you think it's broken, that every single one of these broadcasts starts with a standardized time of silence, so it can be be, be compared to other surveys that are out there. Um, choose the right protocol for your area. Um, I think that's it for ensuring your standard. If you follow those rules, we'll have nice data when it comes in. So data, what do you do with the data? How do you collect the data? Some of us are old school. We like data forms. We had data forms for the OWL survey. And you'll notice that we track detections by the minute for a lot of these species for the owls and for the night jars. And that relates again to that standard survey and knowing which species were heard in the silent listening period and as um, the different species broadcasts were played. Um, there's also a place on there for breeding code. Now, I'm not going to go over this one, but I thought I'd at least show it to you. This is a March morning program um, for. Um, I would be inclined to use this in the field and not the app just for my own personal choice because I find dealing with the app slows down my ability to look at things. Um, but this is a busy survey, which makes it a lot more difficult on an app. Some people are probably great at it. With my app skill, I would stay away from it, but that might be an age thing. We won't go there. Um, and then when you collect your data, you can also enter it. There's a couple ways to enter, enter it. Um, you can use the um, data entry system online and enter your data there. Again, it's off the Atlas site, Tool and Resources, Data Entry, Special Surveys. So that's one way to do it. And you log in, and if you don't log in, it will tell you you didn't you did log in right. And I'm going to go over this really quick because we um, don't want to have too much time. And you choose the point that you survey and you enter the data one point at a time. For this system here. Unlike the OWL survey and the Marsh Warning survey when you enter a whole set of stops all together in a row. So you enter your single point, then you choose your protocol type um, based on which survey you did and you put the date that you surveyed and, and that's how it works. Now there's also the app and you can choose to enter the app in the field for some of these programs if, if that's your choice or you can use it after the fact to enter the data. And it looks pretty much the same, except as a warning, the, pro the app shows the protocols that are available at the, the time when you can use them. So if you're in January and looking for the Bard Owl protocol, you won't find it. If you're in June and you're trying to enter OData for the Screech Owl protocol, you may not find it then either. So that's something to keep in mind, that there's enough different studies or point count styles that they're going to adjust those lists based on what is needed at the time. Um, and again, it shows the minute by minute detections that you cover for the species. And um, let me see here. And you can see down here. I hope you can see this, you can add rows for every species you've seen, which is another point. In these surveys, you track each individual target species you record during it. Oops, where's my mouse here? So I also wanted to mention something about ethical broadcasting. Um, these broadcasts are fantastic tools, but remember what you're doing, and I, and I stole this totally from Sarah Rupert, I, I admit it. Uh, you are telling these birds that there's another breeder in their space, and you're stressing them. So the poll choice is to do it quickly, do the survey, play the broadcast once, move on to the next spot. Don't double play it in that spot. Don't use it for purposes outside. Um, that. Now, we, I have mentioned a couple times, maybe this is not the best version in some of those isolated points. True. 
But at the same time, watch if you use a broadcast in those locations. If you can collect that data just by standing there and you can hear the owl, you're done. You know what's there. You can put down a singing. Um, if you know what's there and you're not hearing it, use the broadcast, but only use it once. And once you've got the owl and you mark it down as present and surveyed, you don't need to do it again. Um, if, for example, you do all your point counts in square six, nine, something or another in year one, move on to do your point counts in another square the next year. There's a lot of squares out there and um, a lot of squares in the north in particular that we need people on. So take that effort that you have and move it someplace that went, that's needed versus repeating it in the same location. And don't use the broadcast outside of the scientific program of the atlas. So another question that often comes up is what kind of speakers to buy? And I am not a great one to talk about this because I'm not technical, uh, but we have some hints. You're gonna find every protocol says the loudness that you need, which is the decibels. Um, and to get there, you need to have batteries of some sort, be them lithium, be them C cells, be them double A's, you need batteries of some sort. And the level of loudness is, is pretty much creates a distance you want that cow to carry. And you will notice that there is a, um, a test in the system to test those calls to make sure they're carrying as far as you could, they can. And that is worthwhile to do because then you know it's working. If you don't hear owls, you know, hey, I did it right, no problem. The uh, longer the battery life, the better. Now you're seeing here several options to use broadcast for, and I can't tell you which one's the best. I really can't. I'm hoping, to, I will be doing a survey with my volunteers this year. And if anybody in the Atlas wants to be part of that survey, they're welcome to reach out, reach out to me. Um, and I'm gonna be asking what they like, because I did this a few years ago when it's time to update it. But any of these equipments that you see here will work if they have enough decibels and um, volume. Um, the um, other thing to consider the ones that we use in our office for marsh monitoring is a little square one there. And that one uses an SB, USB um, thumb drive that you put into it. And it's fantastic, but we only use it for that purpose. The Atlas is providing the JBL clip, which is the one that you see on the far right, right there, my right. Um, and that is a great option for many of the programs. Um, so feel free to use this as well. Now, if you're wondering about phone quality and stuff, there's also a great um, conversation on the Discord about that, a lot of information on the Discord about choosing phones and uploading files and things like that as well. Training resources. Um, the training resources are available. You can just see by looking at this list how many more you need for the Marsh Monitoring Program, which is the gray versus the OWL survey um, that's blue. Um, the training resources for the Marsh Monitoring Program is a whole page. The OWL surveys, it's like the sliver on the one side of your web screen. So it's a much easier survey for that. Um, night jars are also easy and you don't even play a broadcast for the night jars. So um, how, Tanya, how are we doing time-wise? I must be awfully close to done here. Um, so maybe I will stop here and, and if we need to share the other sl slide later, I can. Um, have fun out there. Remember that these surveys are done at unusual times. So think of things like water safety. Think of things like keeping yourself visible at night, keeping your car safe. All those things when you're surveying because you're the one who's critically deciding where you should be going out there. I want to make sure that you make it back from a great night of owl survey. And that's it. Um, I don't know if you want to go, uh, Tanya, if I can turn it back over to you. I'll stop sharing. Sure, thanks, Kathy. Uh, you were great for time, still had a couple of minutes left, so we'll probably have a little bit of extra time right at the very end when we're taking questions and uh, uh, we can uh, uh, either cover extra questions or you can cover a couple of things you think you might've missed. Uh, but for now, we will hand things over to Kaylin who will be talking about digital point counts. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna do some... Okay, perfect. Okay, awesome. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. And okay, of course. Okay. 
Alrighty. So um, yeah, thanks so much, Tanya. And uh, I'm going to be doing a quick presentation on digital point counts. It's only going to be 15 or so minutes, but I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Um, this lovely photo of a, a Zoom uh, device that Roxanne took um, doing kind of a, a digital point count there, which is awesome. So I just wanted to start by thanking everyone who has conducted digital point counts so far. Um, the list on the left is kind of the, the, the top digital point counters, I guess I'll say. Uh, and the map that you see in the middle is, uh, is where the digital point counts were distributed. Uh, the 583 there, uh, right in the middle around Sudbury, uh, that was a student crew that we had last summer uh, who were di uh, conducting digital point counts for us. So that was really great to have as well. And so, Perfect. Uh, so we had a total of 849 recordings and 142 bird species that were found on these digital recordings, which is exciting. And so I just wanted to extend a huge thank you to everyone who's done it so far. And uh, hopefully if you haven't uh, done a digital point count yet and you're attending uh, this webinar, you'll be um, more tempted to do one this year or in future years and feel more confident about doing so as well. So. Just to start off, uh, I know we've been mentioning the uh, Atlas website quite a lot today, but um, I did want to mention it again and let you know that there is a conducting a digital point count survey cheat sheet on the website. So if you go to instructions and forms under the tools and resources on the Atlas website, um, this can be found under the point count appendices. Uh, so it tells you everything you need to know about how to set up uh, the Zoom H2N units, um, how uh, kind of what settings you need to have them on, what to do when you get to the actual survey station. Um, you know, you want to press record and, and kind of give some information at the very start of the recording um, and then how to upload it or where to upload it um, so that we can have it interpreted. I'm gonna go over this briefly, but I did just wanna mention that it is on the website as well for you to reference. So the very first step of conducting a digital point count is uh, discussing with your regional coordinator which squares you intend to survey. So if you are the principal atlaser in a square and you want to do the digital point counts there, um, that's totally fine. If you wanted to help out with digital point counts in other squares, especially in the central and northern regions, then definitely talk to your RCs or the regional coordinators of the regions that you're hoping to help out in. Um, and they can help kind of um, guide your efforts uh, so that we don't have kind of duplication of people doing regular point counts and digital point counts. Uh, the second step, uh, if you don't have a Zoom H2N unit, which um, I'm not expecting everyone does, I definitely did not. Um, then you can get one from your RC. Uh, so last year we sent some out to the regional coordinators and this year we're gonna be sending out some more uh, to RCs who have requested them, who think that um, there could be some uptake in their regions. Once you have your Zoom H2N unit, uh, you wanna go uh, to conduct the on-road and off-road point counts. So for the on-road point counts, it is sometimes um, handy to have a tripod that you can uh, stand it on so that it's kind of, uh, like face height, I guess you could say. If it's an off-road point count, uh, what you can do is uh, they come with these bendy tripods that you can wrap around tree branches, kind of similar to that photo that I showed at the very start of this presentation uh, that Roxanne graciously um, has given to us. Um, so you go to the survey, um, and as I kind of alluded to, at the very start, you have to say uh, your name, the date, uh, time, and uh, the square, uh, and then for on-road versus off-road, uh, the on-road points, you could just say what point number it is, so point number two. Um, for the off-road point counts, you have to say uh, the lat and long, the coordinates of where you are, so that we are able to kind of say, all right, this, um, this digital point count occurred here. Otherwise, we have no way of knowing. Oh, and I should say, sorry, I kind of skipped ahead a little bit too quickly. Um, I included at the bottom of this slide um, two very useful resources that are on the Atlas YouTube channel. So the first one um, is conducting digital point count surveys um, off-road and conducting digital point count surveys on-road. Uh, so these are kind of in the field videos of, of how you can conduct these digital point count surveys. 
Uh, so I've included uh, the name of our YouTube channel, Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas-3, uh, if you're ever looking uh, to find those videos and figure out uh, how, to get it, how to get it done in the field. Okay, so once you've surveyed your points, the data need to get from the Zoom unit into wild tracks. So wild tracks is um, where we're storing the digital point count recordings and having them interpreted. So there are two options to get the data into wild tracks. Uh, the first is to upload them onto your computer and then um, bring them into this FTP. I know that sounds very intimidating and it, it was for me at first too, I'm not gonna lie, um, but it is quite easy once you've done it. And I have also included um, the video at the bottom of this, uh, how to upload digital point counts to an FTP site. Um, and so the second option would be to return the equipment to your regional coordinator and then they can upload the data for you if you're not feeling super confident, confident in your abilities to do that. All right, uh, once the data is uploaded into Wild Tracks, the recordings are interpreted by contractors. So this step has already been co uh, completed for the 2021 data. Um, each record, uh, each recording is tagged uh, with the species that are present. Uh, so I don't know if uh, you can see this properly, but um, the very top is the audio recording, uh, the sonogram, uh, and it shows little tags of species that were found at different times in the recording. At the bottom, it has a summary of when the species were recorded, um, either singing, calling, or uh, doing a non-vocal, I guess, yeah, a non-vocal um, finding, I guess, yeah. Uh, so one example would be drumming. Um, and so those are recorded with what time um, they were observed. And so the very last step is to get the data from wild tracks into nature counts. So um, as we've mentioned a few times today, nature counts is the database that the Atlas is using to collect, manage, and store the Atlas data. Uh, and so <clears throat> The data is interpreted in wild tracks and then needs to be uploaded into nature counts so that we can see it in the summaries um, that you all know or have seen about um, in the previous um, webinars today or even just in your own atlasing and so once the data is uploaded uh, that will be reflected in your square summary sheets for example um, if the bird was uh, recorded as singing then it will be uploaded with an s um, if it was calling, it'll be an H and the non-vocal will also be considered as uh, an S. Uh, so this step is still in progress. Uh, this is the first time that uh, an Atlas has tried to up, like bulk upload all this wild tracks data, I'm pretty sure, into nature count. So um, the, the managers of both of these kind of databases are working together to get your data um, reflected uh, in these summaries and to get it into the Atlas, of course. Okay, so um, I do now have a few examples just uh, for fun. I thought that they were really neat and I thought that you would also enjoy uh, seeing, um, seeing some of these uh, in action. So the first recording that we have here is from Region 38. Uh, that's in Thunder Bay at Square 16 UCV 35 and it was done by Alan uh, on June 27th. So you can see the map at the bottom there, uh, the little squares in red are all of the squares that have um, digital point counts conducted in them. And then the square on the right there is um, the square that this recording was done in. And I'm not sure if you can see it, it's kind of hidden behind my sharing options, but at the very bottom, uh, point number four is in red there. So, um, so that's the point where this was conducted. And the very top is uh, the sonogram of the recording. I might need to stop sharing and then reshare with my audio enabled. So just give me one second to do that. Okay, share screen. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share sound and I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Okay. And so, oh, resume slideshow, perfect. Oh, wow, that's so handy. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, uh, so I will turn this up a little bit. Hopefully you will be able to hear this okay. Um, I guess I'll do the first one. I have a few others. You can let me know after this one if it sounded all right or not. Um, oh, 
Here we go. Can someone just unmute and let me know if you could hear it okay? Heard perfectly. Okay, awesome, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so um, I also have included here um, photos of the species that we heard just in those first 20 or so seconds of the recording from uh, Region 38. Um, and so um, I'm gonna do this for a couple more squares. And um, what you might notice, um, I'm gonna do some from different parts of the province and um, the species that are recorded in, in the other squares that I'm showing you are completely different than the ones that are found here is pretty interesting. Obviously it is just a snapshot and there, there likely is some overlap, but yeah. All right, uh, so the second um, example that I'm gonna show you guys is from region 31 uh, and it's by Roxanne. Um, I've seen Roxanne here today. She's been absolutely wonderful. Um, and it's uh, from June 6th, 2021. And again, you can see it's the kind of the Northeastern part of Ontario and point number 12 uh, in that square. All right, so here we go. So those last ones kind of came all at once. And I, I actually think it's pretty impressive that the folks that are interpreting these data are able to kind of pull those apart um, the way that they do, because that, uh, that would be a lot. <laughs> but as you can see, uh, kind of the species composition that we're seeing here, um, again, just a small snapshot of, uh, of what's been found in this recording, um, but pretty exciting. All right, and uh, last but not least, uh, region four, this one's in uh, Middlesex, Elgin. Um, this one was submitted by Susan and uh, is point number 20, as you can see on the right there, kind of circled in red. My apologies, I actually meant to, to warn you guys about the red winged blackbird in that one. Um, it is a little bit deafening and I'm not sure how loud you have your audio. So I'm really sorry if I made any, anyone's ears bleed just there. Um, and so yeah, that's kind of just a, a, a brief overview. Uh, like I mentioned, there is quite a lot of resources on the YouTube channel um, on how to conduct the point counts, the digital point counts, either on road or off road, and how to upload the data to the FTP. Um, once it's in uh, the FTP, uh, it's kind of out of your hands and left to us to, uh, to get interpreted and then to upload into nature counts so that um, everyone's able to see the data and see what species are being found in their squares. And with that, I will open it up to any questions. Great, thanks, Kaylin. And we have quite a few questions to get through. Um, a couple of people were asking about the possibility of extending the survey dates for owls past the end of April this year due to very poor weather and road accessibility issues in the north. And uh, just while you're answering this one, Kathy, I'm going to uh, start up a poll uh, about uh, special surveys. So as Kathy is answering, please feel free to answer uh, the poll question. Um, that's a good question. And it's a question that we're also wondering about for the um, Ontario Nocturnal Owl Survey. And to be frank, I don't have an answer for you yet. Um, there's pros and cons to it. You get too far into May. I think the analysis for my survey will only use the first week of May if I go that route. 
Um, but also you get into owls starting to quiet down because of the, the, the level of development in the breeding season. So I don't know yet. And whether I choose to do it for the owl survey, we'll have to take it back to the committee and see what they think as well. I know that there's a lot of people out there this year who cannot survey, but remember that this is a five-year event. So while we would love to get all this done this year, it doesn't have to be all this done this year. Great, thank you. Uh, another question about Eastern Screech Owl Survey specifically. Anthony would like to know if uh, people should or can complete surveys in each of the five years. I would say it's unlikely to be of value. We already have the data for that point represented in the system. And there are many other squares that we need data collected on. So I would say, I personally would think, no, I'm not seeing any gain from it unless we insist it done for all of them. And that's looking at a different kind of data. We're not doing trends here. We're doing relative abundance. So I think one time at each point is more than enough or is enough. I shouldn't say more than that. And there's a lot of other places you can go instead. Great. Okay, this one's for Kaylin. Uh, I bought a uh, Zoom device last year, it did not come with a Gorilla tripod, so I bought a Joby model separately that worked well, just needed to be sure to get the right attachment for the Zoom device, and sorry, that wasn't a question, that was a comment, uh, but great, thank you for, uh, uh, for that one. Uh, Deb is in the North Boreal region. Um, what birds are included in the special survey and marsh bird list? Is there a list for other regions as well? Um, the special surveys are regionalized, so each one has its own region. Um, where was she from again, Tanya? Um, I think she said just the northern. Sorry, I closed okay. it. Okay, so depending on North where Boreal. you are, you can no doubt do the great gray owl. Um, that's great gray owl boreal. You can probably do the night jar survey. You can probably do bard, but that's that's questionable depending on how far north you are. Um, you could probably, what am I missing here? Northern Hawk Owl is a new one that would be fun up there. So, the, so you have to pretty much look and see what's in your region. Marsh monitoring, if you have marshes that fit the protocol, um, then yes, you can do the marsh monitoring survey and you just collect whatever birds. The marsh monitoring, you have a target list of rails and bitters you collect, but at the same time, you, you do a suite of um, other birds that are found there as well. And frankly, I haven't looked into it deep enough to see if you do as many species as you do with the regular marsh monitoring, but I'm assuming you do. Um, because he says you need to be able to identify all birds in that area. Um, so it would all depend. In the north, the coolest thing about the Atlas Marsh Survey is that you can, can go a little bit away from that classic marsh with the emergent vegetation, because you can also do it in open, sh low shrub marshes or wetlands. So if you see some place has a lot of like bog rosemary or a lot of low-lying sh open shrubs with a lot of open sun over it, you can also survey in that area, which that's one of my favorite kinds of wetlands. I really wish I could get up there and do that. That'd be a lot of fun to do. We can, I think we can close off our, 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 our poll. Um, so I think that's, that's quite interesting. Right now, we, we only had 66% of participants completed, but it looks like, um, 60% have never surveyed, so I hope you will take this, these opportunities on, and just under 40% have. So that's kind of really nice to know to see who's here and who's learning, and, and we do hope all the no's become yeses for the next time we ask the question. Agreed. Uh, Lynn has a question about wetland size requirements for the marsh bird survey as opposed to the marsh monitoring program. Is there a wetland size requirement? There's a wetland size requirement. It is still one hectare, 100 by 100 meters, size of a classic sports field, this kind of size. That's what you need to do the survey. It can be part of a larger wetland complex that can be more woody. So if you have that marsh, that habitat patch of appropriate marsh habitat, it can be part of a larger concept that's also 
swamp because swamps still can't be serving in it. But you do need that minimum size. And I think in that perspective, um, this particular protocol is a little tighter. They want that 100 meter by 100 meter um, because they're covering so many squares. I should mention that you don't, if you only have seven or six or five points in your Atlas Square for the marsh monitoring, you can do that. You don't have to do all eight. Do as many as you can find in your, in your square. Great. Uh, a question from Stephen. Last year, I found no previous marsh bird survey points in my region or the adjacent one. I chose two locations that were reasonably accessible. Both points were wetlands that fed into opposite shores of two branches of the same river. They were entered into Nature Counts last year with Kaylin's guidance. Should I return to those same two points this year? Um, they were not part of the point system, if I understand right. Um, so I would think no, unless the points have changed and Kaylin would be able to answer that different, better than I can. Um, they've been surveyed once already and I believe you only need to attend, go to each point once. Okay, Kaylin says I said the right thing, so we'll go with that. <laughs> Great. Okay, uh, Jim wants to know, if you purchase a Zoom device, can you just use it or does it need to be specially purchased? Sorry, would you mind repeating that? I just froze for a minute there. <laughs> no problem. If someone purchases a Zoom device, uh, can they just use it or does it need to be specially programmed? No, as long as you follow the guidance on the cheat sheet for programming it, you should be all set. Great. Um, if I have much fewer than eight appropriate sites for marsh breeding in my square, so just one or two, um, should they still conduct the special survey? I would ask for if it's a priority square. And if it is, then definitely. If it isn't, take a close look nearby and see if there's a priority square right near you that's not being surveyed. Ask your RC and do that one first. And if you want to do the two afterwards, it's fine. But we, we would really like to see those priority squares done for the March survey. Okay, if someone only gets five points done on an owl survey this year, would they do another five in another? So five one year, five the next. That's a tough one. They obviously can do it. How the people doing the analysis handle it, whether they decide that doesn't suit if you had 10 points and you didn't do them at the same time, I don't, I can't honestly answer that. That's an analytical question afterwards. It would, if, I can see that happening, for example, if you have them all up two opposite ends of your square. But the, um, I would say it's better than not doing it, but I think I'd rather see them all surveyed in one night if you could, if, there's, if there is 10 points there. If, if that's a question for the North, then definitely uh, feel free to, to, to do the other 10, five next year. Um, but I don't really understand, have a good answer on how that's gonna be handled analytically. Makes sense. Um, if some of the points are too remote or too hard to access by vehicle, can I just skip over those points without assessing habitat and proceed to assessing the next points that I know will, I will be able to reach without trouble? Yes. If you go to site 12 and you have to snowshoe in two miles, that is not appropriate habitat for the human doing the survey. So just go on to the next one. Great. Um, will it be possible for digital point counters to get reports for their points from the interpreters? They could be a useful learning tool. Yeah, we'll have to talk to WildTracks about that. We're still figuring out how the data is going to talk between WildTracks and Nature Counts. So um, that is something that um, they'll potentially maybe just have to follow up with me about and, and we can kind of work on, on that. Great, thanks, Kaylin. Uh, the marsh monitoring priority map shows some squares highlighted in blue and some in green. What is the difference? I think there's, I think there's three colors there. One of them is, let me just pull it up here. One of them is coastal AOCs. 
Uh, one of them, there's, there's, there's a logic behind them. One of them is coastal AOCs. Um, one of them is coastal non-AOCs and the other one is other. And what does that mean is there's 40 odd areas of concerns around the Great Lakes with lower water and harbor and health qualities in that particular location. Examples are things like Toronto, um, Windsor, Niagara River, those kind of places. And that's what an AOC is. And that's a priority area for marsh knowledge. Um, and data collected on those sites actually streams right into the um, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement analysis and, and quality indicators. So they're important, they're just a little different. The yellow ones are all the other ones. They're also important for the atlas, don't get me wrong. Those You need all those yellow points done for the atlas as well. But so you got three different levels of points there. Good to know. Uh, and one more question about digital point counts. Um, are you able to determine distance using digital point counts? I wouldn't think so. So how will this data be analyzed and used with the non-digital point counts? Yeah, so uh, we're not doing distance with those digital point count recordings, um, but our regular Atlas point counts uh, just have two intervals. So there's two time intervals, uh, minutes one to three, and then minute four and five. Uh, so those are the two intervals, whereas we do have the Atlas six, six interval point count, which has the two times and then three distance bands. So the digital point counts would just be comparable to those like regular um, standard Atlas point counts. Great. Um, actually, Tanya, I have to re-answer that question you gave me. Mike Burrell has corrected me. I am working off Doug's old map from last year's presentation. So his dots there are red, blue, and, and yellow. From what I understand from what Mike is saying in the chat, um, blue are supposed to be done by volunteers, green are being done by pay crews. So trust that map if it's in the protocol and not the one I gave. That'll be the more accurate one. Great, thank you, Kathy. And sorry, Kaylin, you notified me about other polls, but I'm not seeing them right now. So possibly we can do them later. Um, I can I can do them. Um, I can set them up. So um, so we had our first poll that was just asking if you had completed any special surveys. Um, Forty percent of you said yes, and sixty percent of people who responded said no. So for those of you who said yes, we do have a poll. Um, and we have one right after this for those who said no, but if you did say yes, um, which surveys have you done? And you should be able to click more than one here. Thanks guys for doing these polls. They're gonna be really handy to have because we're wondering how popular these items are. This is the first season this year for the full March survey, isn't it, Kayla? Um, we, we started it last year, but um, we got it out kind of right as it was supposed to be starting. I think other people were focusing on uh, getting their uh, general atlasing and their point counts done, but we did actually have a bit of uptake, especially on the owl surveys last year, um, and uh, to a lesser extent on the marsh bird surveys. Yeah, I think I think the marsh bird survey in the north is going to be fun, but that's my bias, right? Because I used to work <laughs> in the northern, in the northern um, marshes up there, and they're just fantastic. So... Um, yeah. I wish I was one of the ones who could go up there and do those squares. Yeah, I mean, Kathy, you should just take a road trip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, okay, I'm going to end this poll. I, I see we haven't had too much activity in the last uh, couple of minutes, so I'll end it. Um, I can share the results. And uh, it's kind of, as I was saying, a lot of, especially the Eastern Screech Owl survey, that's not surprising because we have a lot of folks. And the central owl one is not surprising easy. Like that's, that's, that's straight cottage country birding and it's easy to do. Nightjar survey is actually kind of fun. And I think the way it's set up here, there's fewer points than in the real Canadian Nightjar survey, which is a long night. Um, so I, that's a really cool one to do. I might have to try that one this year because I've, for a long story, lost my Nightjar survey route. Yeah, I, I do my Nightjar nice survey with both my parents for my dad's birthday. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, and so uh, as promised, uh, the last poll is um, if no, uh, why not? So if you had not uh, done any of the special surveys yet, um, what is the reason? And there is an other at the bottom because obviously our, our, our answers, our generated answers might not capture everything. 
And as people are answering that one, as people are answering this uh, last one, there's one more question about digital point counts. Um, how do you count individuals of the same species? I know that during a live one, uh, it's the if it's the same one um, and it calls again for the same direction, then um, we've already talked about that, but the information isn't available with recordings. Yeah, so it's uh, typically if species are calling at the same time, um, then we'll count them as, you know, species one and species two. Uh, Mike Burrell has done some interpretation. He might be able to give us a little bit more insight as to the inner workings of it. But uh, those are the ones that I've mostly seen is, is species kind of calling, uh, yeah, the same species calling at the same time. Mike's here, perfect. Yeah, that's pretty much it. But the recordings, they are um, usually in stereo too. So you do get a sense of like one bird singing over on one, one side of you and then another one's over on the other side. and you can hear differences in volume too. So you, you get you get more sense of what's around you than you might expect. Great, okay, I think we can probably end the last poll. Perfect, and yeah, I'll go ahead and share it. Kathy, if you wanna go over what people have said here. Well, first off, Mike will be very happy to know that 47% of you um, are going to try these surveys. He's really looking forward to seeing the data that this Mike Cabin, Mike Burrell is probably equally excited. Um, and other, very curious that the next most common ones are others. Third is the same level as don't feel I have the skill. It's quite common for certain birders to sit there and question their ability to do a certain type of citizen science. And don't undervalue your skill, especially with these few species ones, like the night jars um, and the owls. They're much easier than the larger skill set surveys. So give yourself a chance, maybe try it. And if you like, and you feel confident doing it, continue on and do all the points in your square. Give yourself a chance on that. Um, and not my kind of birding? Absolutely. I can see that that's about 4% of the answers, and I agree. People like them or they don't. That's how citizen science works. There's, some, there's a kind that fits each individual, and that's the one you should go for. Great. Okay. Um, thank you both, Kaylin and Kathy. Um, I'm very sorry we went a little bit over time for this session, but uh, uh, right now I am going to hand it over to uh, to Natasha.